Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School and an, a LePage faculty fellow at the A.B. Friedman School of Business at Tulane, and I just want a quilt. Okay, so today we have Lisa Rubel from Paint Brush Studios. She is awesome. She talks to us about this fabric company and what they do. She also sent us samples of their truck food. Trucks, uh, line by Jamie Vaughn and some solids that were gorgeous. Uh, my name is Lisa Rubel and I'm currently living in Orlando, Florida. Oh, how is that? Is it like, you know, is it like, do you feel like Disneyland is on top of you or do you feel like you can just live a regular life? Well, both. Um, you can definitely live a life without Disney being involved in it, but I have three boys who are 10, 7, and 4. <laughs> you can. Uh, and we're, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not down here long term. We're down here for oh. a, a specific period of time. So we, oh, we were all in on the Disney thing. That's great. Um, so we, we definitely do a fair amount of it, but we also live far enough away that it's not in our faces. Every oh, well, that's good. Right. So it's an effort to get there, not just, you know. It's about 40 minutes. So it's, oh. you know, we don't see it outside the window every day kind of thing. Awesome. Okay. And we'll start with the question. We start with the second question, which is what's your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? So when I grew up, my mom for the most part stayed at home. And, uh, but what she did like many women to make a little side money as well as play around with her hobby is she sewed things and sold them at craft fairs. So she was always, it was a lot of applique because there's a lot of kids stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. So like little bibs, wall hangings. um, I don't think she did a lot of clothing, but more just smaller projects. So she was always doing that. And, you know, we were around because we were kids. So I learned how to sew at a, a fairly young age um, and didn't got into quilting a little bit later. But I remember sewing uh, clothes for my Cabbage Patch kids, making a tote bag. And most of it was just kind of, you know, I had an idea and, and made it. I didn't get into following patterns until later on. And, and how do you think getting into sewing that way impacts like who you are now? Do you feel like that was a good way to get into it? Or do you feel like you should have had patterns? Uh, it just sort of became a way of, it just was a part of life. And yeah. having patterns, uh, I feel like it gave me more opportunity to just experiment and not feel like I had to, you know, follow the rules and that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't feel constrained by, okay, I have to do exactly what this says. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, okay, so how, what's your, what, so tell me how you got to where you are today. What's, what's the quick path on sort of, who is Lisa? <laughs> so I spent uh, eight years as a quilting magazine editor. And I started mm-hmm. doing that because I uh, had worked for a manufacturing magazine and we moved and I realized I could find a magazine working for what I enjoyed writing about instead of manufacturing, which was kind of boring. So I, uh, having always worked, done sewing and crafting and that type of thing, I got into uh, crafting magazines and started working on a quilting magazine. And I'd already been quilting on my own a little bit, but that definitely launched me into quilting and into meeting all different types of people in the industry and, and working right. with fabric quilt and that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, and so I did that for eight years. And then for the last seven years, I've been freelancing and working with, uh, working with fabric quilts on their social media and designing patterns for them and doing some other pattern design and proofing and that type of thing. Very cool. And so how do you like what, so you've been in both instances of like full-time inside a company and now freelancing um what's the pros and cons of each like do you see them similar or different or sort of who you are does it change who you are in terms of you know your life or your daily life so it had a lot to do with where I was at different times in my life when I was the magazine editor I didn't have kids yet so I had a lot more time and I could devote a lot more time to work and not have to worry about all of those extra things on the side. Yeah. And after I had kids, it started, I got to the point where the job 
the kids were getting in the way of my job. And that's when I knew it was time for a switch. Yeah. And so I switched over to, to working freelance. And obviously when you have a salary job, you know, the money is guaranteed, you know what you're doing every day, you know, who you're yeah. working for that type of thing, which it is nice, but there's uh, a lot more freedom in what I do now. Yeah. Yeah. There also, you have to have a lot more self-discipline, obviously, because yeah. you're working for yourself and meeting deadlines for different people and finding different ways to generate income. Yeah, no, I get it. I mean, it's, you know, it's only, they're only small for a decade, right? Yeah. So, I mean, um, and our working lives are longer. I get it. I kind of why I'm a law professor. I wanted to spend, I didn't want to be a, a, a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, I wanted the, I liked, I liked the job. I liked the time to be with the kid and all that. So. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, now looking back in hindsight, it's, it's been a blessing as well because, as you know, from looking around at the industry, you know, yeah. magazines are struggling. Uh, both the companies I worked for no longer put out. One doesn't one doesn't exist anymore and one no longer puts out quilting magazines. So I, I got out at a good time. Interesting. And you transitioned to more of what's happening now, it seems like, with social media and other things, but sort of translated your skills to a new space that's now thriving. Absolutely. Well, and that's how I got involved with uh, Paintbrush Studio is yeah. I had, we were meeting with them at market and talking about, this was back in 2011, talking about how, you know, social media really was going to be the next thing in the quilting world. And uh, they were saying that they needed to get into it. And so I came back and said, hey, I, you know, I can write about quilting, I can quilt, I, you know, I'd love to help you do this. And so that's how I got involved working with them. Very interesting. So tell us a little bit about Paintbrush Studios. So it's a fabric company based in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. It was a family-owned company and started out with um, doing a lot of quilted fabric for, um, like, for uh, clothing, basically, for uh, construction and that type of thing. They did a lot of quilted fabric for that and then realized that they should diversify a bit and moved into quilting fabric as well as quilted linens for hotels. And they still do business in all those different areas, but in the last 10, 10 years or so, you know, the quilting focus has really grown and they've come with, uh, brought out some exciting new designers and then three or four years ago launched the Painter's Palette Solids Fabrics, which is some of what Right, some of what you sent. Right, hard, so. right, and what you guys uh, at QuiltCon, there was a lot of this, right? That you guys yeah. are really focused on this because obviously the modern cultures love the solids, so that was it, right. These are great. So I have a thousand questions for you. So let's maybe we'll start with the solids. Um, tell me about well, first of all, you sent the um, this palette. The palette solids, right? Yep, with all um, 168 colors. 168 colors. Okay, well, I, the first thing I was just like, well, how, like, you you sent me a pack, but, like, I think I'm starting at the, at the very end of our conversation, which is how does a quilt shop choose the colors? Like, I, you know, when I see this, I'm like, I just need all of them. <laughs> <laughs> like, send me all of them. I was um, say, you know, ideally, right? yes, you just right. you get just, all of them. Right. <laughs> Right. I just need uh, all 62. So um, uh, is it 62? Yeah, 62. So um, tell me, what's your strategy or what should somebody's strategy if you're a quilt shop? How do they buy or uh, somebody who's buying bolts of fabric? How do you even, do you just pick ones you think are pretty or yeah. I don't know, do you do a certain kind of, I just don't know how you even start with all these beautiful colors. It, it definitely can be overwhelming because there are so many choices. Uh, and yeah. especially because a lot of quilt shops, you know, may already carry a solid line. And yeah. so they're, you know, whether they're looking to transition or have painter's palette as a secondary line, because the fabrics are super smooth and silky and just. They are super smooth and, and silky. I don't, I don't and they're very. Solids. What? I said, I don't use any other solids anymore. You don't. It just feels so nice. It's so interesting because we've been looking at solids and they're all different. <laughs> so yes. I was kind of surprised that like, I, you know, I thought a solid was a solid, but these are like um, thicker. There's a kind of, they th- they're almost like woven. They're like, I don't know. I mean, I know cotton is woven. I'm, just, I'm, I'm being ridiculous, but there's well, it's, strength it's, to it. That's not true cool. with all of them, right? Yeah. It's called a 62 square weave yeah and what that means 
basically because that number doesn't mean a lot to everyday quilters mm-hmm. is that the fabric is tighter than yeah. other fabrics and it, it uh, has been shrunk to be tighter and the colors are super vibrant what I like to do when I because really it's feeling it that makes a difference and totally. what I that's right it really is it's really yeah. diff- they're very um I don't know they just feel really strong and you know there's like a as you said they're tighter they're like yeah and also they're 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 not transparent they're I mean, they're because I've seen other ones that are very thin. Yeah. And I was surprised at that when I got to that, that it seemed very kind of too delicate, I guess, yeah. for um, some Well, and I tell people to hold up the white because a lot of whites, if you put your hand behind yeah. it, you can see through it. You can see through it. And you That's can right. But yeah. to go back yeah. to your question about how do you choose? Um, yeah, how do you choose? So we've done a couple things. Uh, the the art department at Paintbrush Studios has put together a trend palette for 2019, oh, which is cool. a more select group of, of colors that are trendy right now in fashion, in home decor, and that right. type of thing. Uh, so that, that's definitely one way to go. Obviously, yeah. you know, white and black and gray, you're never going to go wrong with those as neutral. Right. Right. Um, we've also been working with Jackie Gehring. Who you have. is you know, right. extremely well known in the quilting world. Right. We've interviewed and, her actually. Um and she's, she's fantastic, she's, isn't she? She's, her stuff is so pretty. Uh yes. we all aspire to be her. Yes. yes. Um well, so she, yeah. She lives in Kansas City. Um That's and awesome. she works a lot in solids. So she uh has happily for us fallen in love with the uh, painter's palette solids. So she put together a collection called Jackie's Favorites. Right. Okay. I'm on um, oh, there we go. Yeah, um, I think they sent you something about that. She uh, curated a group of about 20 fabrics in just gorgeous, bright colors, uh, yeah. cools and warms together. And They're so really pretty. That, that's really cool. another way to go because, you know, yeah. Jackie's got great taste in color and she's very well known. So that's another great thing. We also in the past three marches have done a March Madness tournament called Mad for Solids. Yeah. Had different designers choose their, their an eight color palette. And then we've set it up as a bracket and they we've let the public vote on the blog, on Facebook and on Instagram to uh, narrow it down to the, the winning palette for the year. And so that those are available to be seen on all of our social media from the, the one that we just had in March. And so that's another way you can kind of piggyback off of someone else's really uh, great. color collection. Right. So I'm looking at the trends, the 2019 trends. I saw the Jackie one. Is it the birthstone series? What's the birthstone series? So oh. the, that is right. another cool thing. So those are um, patterns done by MJ Kinman. Uh-huh. And it is, um, they're jewels. Right. They and are so jewels. she has designed these, these quilts and you uh, then picked a palette for each one so that you can make these very realistic looking birthstones. So there are the uh, the different bundles that work with each of the the birthstone months to create that that quilt block or mini quilt or however you'd like to finish it. I love it. Um, and then where you sell wholesale, if someone's looking for wholesale, they they connect with you. Um, yep. And I like that your minimum isn't horrible because that's also people that it's I think it's. 250 is it two like three bolts at 250 or 350 I can't remember what I um and uh so that's reachable for people that if yeah. they have a wholesale license that it isn't a two thousand dollar that they they get that there are small there are smaller buyers Absolutely. Um, which I think is fantastic um all right so that's the solids um anything else now the other question is how like how are solids like how do you get to the solid? Like, how does, what's the process of making solids? Do we have a sense of like, like I get the designers, but, and the solids are so pretty that it is, I know that there's gotta be, there's gotta be some work and even in solids. So tell, is there, what's the process of creating a solid color or a solid line? It, it definitely starts with the fabric that you're using and then the color, you know, comes later, but it's, yeah with the weave of the fabric that makes a big difference and then the uh, the the big thing is it's choosing which colors because i mean like you see there's 168 colors yeah. on there, which is a, a great selection but at the you know at the same time you've got to choose okay do we want a red that's got a little more orange in it or a red that's got a little more blue can we do both and have them be different enough from each other that they you know that shops would would want to carry both so yeah, there's a lot of work with uh, with 
choosing the colors based on you know what was popular in home decor and in trends at the time and then yeah. coming up with with the fun names for them which is fun you know looking at paint chips for inspiration I mean yeah. think about nail polish there's all right. those great names right. on nail polish and that type of thing so right. it you know it's starting with the the right raw materials and then choosing a wide variety of colors that really hits hits the range that quilters would be interested in working with that's really interesting and where are where can uh, if you're not a whole if you're not buying wholesale where where can you find or how do you find where you could find it locally or online? So on the Paintbrush Studios website, there is a, uh, under purchase, there is right. a okay. That's right. store button. That's right. Okay. We're doing it. And you can do that. And then it, it shows, you can actually choose which fabric line you're looking for. I'm looking at it as well on my second screen. Oh, look at that. That's so nice. You can yeah, so you from, can select so paper just doing solid. That's really nice, actually. Um, and uh, if people are listening and they want to look at the website, it's pbsfabrics.com. Correct. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm switching. Oh, no locations found. Okay, let's go figure. So if you can't find some place, like I just can't find place in. Yeah, and you can adjust the uh, the search radius as well. And do you have... Um, Low is 40, but I like to put in the no limit because then you, with, with online ordering these days, oh, that's the way to get, that, that was what I was going to ask is, is there a way to get to, yeah. So A&E, so that's the big store, right? That's a big store in Florida. That's our closest. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And the fabric shop. Uh, and then I'm looking to see if it has any, if it brings up the online shops too. Does so it? pineapple fabrics in North Carolina uh, carries all of the solids. Awesome. So that is a great resource as well. But this is also the kind of thing, especially because we've talked about how you don't realize how what a solid is like until you've got it in your hand. So if someone, yeah. uh, if a listener wants more of these fabrics, go yeah. into a quilt shop and say, hey, I'd love for you to order right. some of these painter's palette solids because right. the shop might not be aware of it right. or might not have felt the fabrics. And really, once you feel them, it, it's hard to use other other solids. Yeah. Okay. So, and right. So, and then pineapple fabrics is pineapplefabrics.com. So you can just yes. go there um, and you can, you can get the fabrics there. Awesome. Yes. Go into your fabric shop and say, Hey, I want these. Um, awesome. Okay. Let me get back to my list. Okay. All right. So tell me the, um, like, uh, but you also said, let's, let's do the other two bits of fabric and then we can kind of get into sort of how it all works. Okay. So you sent me this really like food trucks, which is by, is it Judy Fawn? Yes. Um, which is, uh, I opened them at um, law school and the law students went crazy. Um, they cool? my kid. They're so cool. So they're really adorable. They're food trucks and donuts and pizza. They're different food trucks with different signs on them and forks and ice cream, all kinds of things. It's really great. Pretzels. The pretzels were a very big hit here. <laughs> and so were the drinks. People really like the little I drink know, things. Aren't they cute? They're so cute. So Tell me the process of sort of um, like we could use Genie or, or any of them. Sort of what the process is for design. So were they, are they on, they're not, they're on, imagine they're independent contractors that you don't, they're not designing, they're not in, tell me about their, tell me, just tell me what happens. <laughs> right. So there's a couple different ways that it works. Um, sometimes if you have designers that aren't necessarily in the quilting world, you know, they more work in the art licensing world. Yeah can have a relationship with them from more of a licensing standpoint yeah. where they just create the art and then you, you make it into fabric. And, um, in that, and in that case, are they aware of what is required for fabric or do you work with them? Like, are they artists first or are they, they fabric artists that know the requirements for fabric? It, there's some of each. Um, I would say in the licensing world, it's more people that are artists first. And so, you know, there needs to be some discussion about, hey, we need different scales for the fabrics. We need contrast. We need right. small prints, you know, that can be blenders to to work as backgrounds to give your eye a resting place from the big, fun focal prints and that type of thing. Yeah. So, you know, those are all things to consider when you're putting together a fabric collection. Uh, you know, do the prints work together? Yeah. If you have yellow in these three, do you need yellow right. in the fourth so it ties right. in? That type right. Of thing. And... Um, and is there a place for people, like, let's say there's someone out there or someone who's like, oh, my daughter would be so great or my son would be so great at this. 
is there a place for people to understand how to design fabric? Like how do they get the experience or understanding of these things if that's something that that's interests them? Well, I would say one resource would be looking at fabric companies' websites to see what's yeah. in existing uh, lines. You'll look yeah. at Spoonflower where you can design your own fabric mm-hmm. and that type of thing. There's a lot of information there, but yeah. it's also something that fabric companies will will work with designers on. You know, they're always looking for the next great idea and are right. certainly willing to to help someone get there and right. help so, them know. So it's more about the art and less about, I mean, if they, if you, if you're an artist with really, really interesting ideas that would go on fabric, that that's the skill that that matters yeah. as opposed to like, I know how to do, you know, I don't know how to make the hamburgers look, you know, like how to make this so that people will want to put it into quilts. Um, yeah. Um, this is so great. Your fabric, the fabric is so cute. Um, okay. So Judy gets an idea. Does it start with an idea? Does it start with already the relationship? Probably depends. Right? It, it depends. Yeah. Sometimes it depends on if the fabric company goes out after the person pursues them or if the licensees, you know, I think most licensees usually have agents. So, you know, if the agent comes to the fabric company, that type of thing. Um, Median had this idea to work with the idea of food trucks, which obviously are super hot right now. Right. You know, that's something you see a lot in quilting is fabric based on the, I mean, look at the hedgehogs from a couple of years ago. Right, right, right. And llamas, llamas. Yes, and llamas, absolutely. Llamas, right. So she had this idea and the the food trucks she chose to, to showcase were not so much the you know, the higher end fancy food trucks of today, but more the the comfort junk food that we all grew up with. Uh, you know, the donuts, yeah. the ice cream cones, the pretzels, the that type of thing. So, you know, and if you look at Jeannie's work, um, which I have, have done as I was pr- finding information about her to, to share on the blog and whatnot, yeah. you know, she definitely has, has a, a palette and she went with more of a a, a vintagey palette for yeah, these. Yeah, it feels like that, right? Yeah, sort it of does into the you know the the topic that she's doing and that fits really well and so she came up with the different designs and then typically the the artist will work with the fabric company to narrow it down to okay we're going to show like for example the pretzels come in navy teal and a, a brownish color so to narrow it down to the colorways that you're going to do and you know the size of each of the prints and that type of thing right making sure the stuff I was talking about before about scale yeah and value right Uh, also things like directional prints you know directional prints are a big thing in quilting because it it affects how your quilt looks so making sure that there aren't too many in the line or that they're you know that they're going the right direction so they're easy to use for borders and that type of thing right right I love it I love it um and then what's the how long is the process from this the initial ideas and sketches to having it in the shops that depends as well. And it's also changing because, so if you went to a quilt market, say four or five years ago, you would see almost all of the new fabric lines that the fabric companies were showing to shops on fabric. So the, the art pro- process had been done, they printed the, the samples and that's what they were showing quilt shops. And so at that point, the, the fabric was already getting ready to be printed in the mill. And so it was a shorter turnaround from, um, from printing to getting it across the water and then into quilt mm-hmm. shops. But now you have more companies that are going into digital printing. You also, yeah. a lot of the companies, when you go to quilt market now, they're showing you the fabric on paper because the, the time frame has just gotten so much shorter that you can go from paper to fabric so much more quickly. Um, so it's, you know, it really changes. Yeah, so they're in a different place in their process when they're going to market. They don't feel the need to be all the way through the process before. Right. Because the whole process has, has sped up and, and then they can, you know, control. It's like, well, if this fabric line was, was a big hit, then, you know, it's easy to, to ramp up the printing for that type of thing. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and how important is, is market still for the process of getting the fabric into shops? Have you ever been to market? Yes, we have. Okay. It's, um, yes. it's so, thing, right? It, it's like, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's, so I, I went to market starting in 2005. Wow. 
And I went every year when I was a magazine editor, and I've been a couple of times in the last couple of years, but not quite as many. And, it, you know, the numbers for market are, are dropping uh, because you can order fabric online. You have more salespeople coming into your shop. You can see the fabric. You can make the connections with the companies without having to go to market. So I, I think there's definitely still value in going to market and seeing new designs, seeing yeah. trends what everyone else is doing yeah but it's, it's not the only means and it's right. interesting because i mean market's been here for we market is market helped make the modern quilt world that's there's no doubt about it but the right. means of communication have have flourished and so that same notion of why it started like i can't find a yellow fabric is it's just not that same situation so it's interesting to see sort of how is how is market going to remake itself and it's doing that whole threads of success thing in the fall and you know there's a kind of sense of well what's the need you know how does that stay relevant in the industry as forms of communication and means of communication um shift i think well and for pattern designers not so much for the fabric companies because they're bigger entity but when you have all these single person pattern designers it's expensive to have a booth at market Mm -hmm. and you want to make sure that you're making enough money at the show to you know recoup your costs from from paying for the show and so i think that you see fewer pattern designers going because yeah. they they're not making the money on it and you know shops you know it it yeah it, something needs to happen to inject a little a little more life into it that makes sense that makes a lot of sense it's interesting now what about the like where do you put paint um, paintbrush studios in relation to how do we understand the fabric industry um, cause that's also something that I think is really interesting. Like, where do you fit? Like there's these big ones and there's small ones and there's like, you know, uh, and obviously the, all the new DIY spoon flower stuff. Um, so how do we understand this, this space of fabric and how do we understand that so we can use our dollars wisely? Cause I think that's really important for like the general hobbyist to understand that what they buy matters as well. Like who they support, who they care about. Um, that they're smart about where they buy and what they buy. Yep, that makes sense. Well, so Paintbrush Studio, I think, is unique in a couple of respects because it, first of all, it has this solid line. It's, it's been reinventing itself with the solid line. Um, but at the same time, there's still fabric for more traditional quilters. Um, Barbara Eichmeyer has been putting out reproduction lines for the company for the past four years or so. So you get those traditional uh, prints there. And Ro Gregg, who's a well-known quilt des- or fabric designer, she puts out a lot of those, the big, beautiful florals and that type of thing. So, you know, still trying to hit those, those traditional quilters that would be more that way. But then also really trying to speak to all of the new modern quilters with lines right. like food trucks and obviously the solids and that type of thing. Right. And you send abstract collage too, which we haven't talked about yet, which is oh, so yeah. cool. Yeah. But we'll get to that in just a second. So well. yeah. So you say put out stuff that people like to buy. That's the first part of it. Right. Is that what you're saying? Um, and then how do you fit within the other fabric companies? How do we understand you? How, how do we understand like, I don't know, how do we understand all of this? Like, what does it mean to be buying from, like, I really do like to buy things at places that I want to support the people and their things. So how is paint, how is buying from paper studio different than say Kaufman or Moda or something like that? Or maybe they're not, you just like what you like. And you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't understand how to understand the fabric, the fabric side of the fabric company. You know, honestly, I think it, it is so much about just what speaks to you. Yeah. You know, you've got a lot of, um, consumers out there, a lot of quilters who are super brand name conscious, yeah, um, yeah. similar to clothing, uh, right, where right. you have, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to buy this just because it has this name on it. That's right. Um, that's you know, right. and again, that's something that totally carries over from the fashion industry, and and that's that's great. But and, you, and you've got that with the Jackie Gearing collection, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Jackie's favorites. Like there are people that are like okay, well, we're going to buy them like that, that, that she's helped curate sort of, we like Jackie, we like what she makes. So I'm going to buy that, that palette. Um, So that's totally makes sense. And, and we are in a celebrity um, world and we also trust the people that we like that we say, Oh, well, I like Jackie's stuff. So therefore she, I mean, there is some legitimacy to it. It isn't just sort of blind, like Jackie's amazing. So I have to, you know, follow whatever she does. I think there's some 
legitimacy into liking that. So I interrupted you, but I'm not sure where we are now. (laughs) You know, what's interesting that ties into your whole project is so much of the quilting world is about copying Um, and not, not, I'm not talking in the bad way, but you you don't go to an art class and try to redo Starry Night. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn the techniques and then you do something different. But when you're buying quilt patterns, when you're buying quilt magazines, when you're buying fabric from your favorite designer, chances are it's because you you want to recreate a quilt that's out there. I mean, yes, there are absolutely people that create new patterns, new designs, that type of thing. And you think that's okay? Because I'm getting a lot of uh, I think that's okay. But like, uh, particularly since you've been in the magazine business, like what? Our patterns, like this notion of recreate, I keep saying that it's like making a puzzle. Like I want to make that puzzle. Like mm-hmm. that that's a totally legitimate component of this business. Like Absolutely. Because yeah. there are a ton of people, a ton of quilters out there who if they weren't following someone's pattern, weren't following even I mean, there are people who take a quilt pattern into a store and say, I want the fabrics to make my quilt look like this. That's why yeah. there are kids, you know, it right. makes it easy. But the all of those people, if that was not an option in the quilt world, they wouldn't quilt because yeah. they're not confident enough to go out on their own and say, mm-hmm. okay, I like this black and white quilt, but I'm going to make it in red and green just for fun. Right. And so I think the key component to that is that you need to yeah. give credit. You know, yes, I made this quilt. I'm going to show it on Instagram. But I, I need to then in the comments say, you know, this is a pattern by so-and-so. Right. And, you know, to put that information out there so someone's not thinking that it's your own. But that's that's how pattern designers, that's how magazines, that's how the book companies make their money is from people who are looking to recreate what someone else has done. Do you think that they should also be including the fabric line that they're using, that that's part of it as well, that, you know, if um, I make a quilt and I'm like, I I made the, I got the pattern from this person and I, and it's food trucks by Jeannie Fawn at Paintbrush Studios. Do you see that as, you know, that provenance isn't always included. We can make right. scrappy stuff so they don't have all, we, we've been doing this licensing thing about, uh, you know, when a license, you know, how, how to understand license on fabric and can you track the licenses, but like, are, should we be more aware of that as people using fabric? So honestly, I think the breakthrough of quilting in social media, especially Instagram, is a huge one with it, has made that so much more common that people do that. And sure, for the fabric companies, it's wonderful for someone to give that shout out because then all of your Instagram followers see it and they want to go out and buy that fabric too and that type of thing. So great from that perspective. But if if you do Instagram, you know, you see that people are always linking to, you know, putting in the, the links for the, the patterns they're using and for the fabrics because people yeah. want to know that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So whereas in the past, even at quilt shows, um, you know, I, I've seen it at quilt shows where someone will use a different person's, a designer's pattern, and it's not credited on the little placard. And in my opinion, that's something you need to do. Yeah. But as we're moving more and more to sharing with the whole world, that's becoming a key component is – I made this quilt and part of why it looks so great is the pattern by this person. And part of it's because I use these fantastic fabrics. And right. I mean, you look at the yeah. people who fabrics have become such a treasured thing. Yeah. Not in the old days, like where it was, cause that's all you had, but you have people who say I've had this fabric line for five years. I can't right. bear to cut into it. It's my, you know, it's like their special pretties that they pet. Right. Um, and so it is becoming much more about the fabric. Now, the other question I get is, let's say I'm a young pattern designer and I, um, I, I fall in love with the food truck, uh, food trucks line and I make a pattern and then I want to, to put the pattern out there. I want to put that. I want to take a picture of the quilt I made. How do you feel about that? Like, it, or do they need to get permission from the fabric company to be doing that? Uh, do you feel like it's OK to have it if you're a designer? Like, what's your advice? Because, you, again, you're in, in this really interesting duality of the magazines and now a company that does fabric. How should we understand these? Because then other people are like, oh, we should just do solids because I'm afraid that I'm going to get in trouble if I use this uh, fabric for the picture of my quilt. Right? I think that it's completely okay. Yeah. And, you know, your your best bet, honestly, is to tag 
the fabric company, you know, use the hashtag for the, the fabric line yeah. in your post because chances are the company sees it. I mean, you're in, a, I mean, you're helping them essentially because right. you're right. showcasing their fabric in a pattern that somebody might be interested in. So yeah. I see that as a mutually beneficial situation where okay. maybe the fabric company will help to promote your pattern since it's making their fabric look great. Yeah. And you're doing the same for them so that it, that works out well for That's both. Okay. And do you think that they need to reach out to the fabric company to let them know or not worry about it? Just go ahead, just do it. It's all fine. I don't think they have to reach out, but I, I think it, it only creates good possibilities if they do because they can help each other out. Now, the other question we've been looking at is licensing of the fabric. The idea is that I go and I buy this fabric. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, I love this fabric. I bought it. Um, and I don't know if you have, can I see? See, this is interesting. See, this is why we are doing our licensing thing because when you buy fabric, you don't always necessarily have the information about the fabric. You have a fact order. Fabric. You have fact order. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, which I think is really interesting, too, from an industry side, to think about, like, if labeling, right? And, and uh, the courts say that you can label every 18 inches, I think, 24 okay. inches, and it's okay. fine. So just the fact that it, just because you don't have the label on what you get, the courts don't care. So right. that's fine. So food trucks by Jeannie for... Genie Fun for Paintbrush Studios Fabric pat, Pattern. It has the pattern number. So this one has this one. That, okay. That one, that. okay. Okay. So what can I do with this fabric? I can make a fat. I make, can make something for my kid, right? I can make a fat and I can, you're fine with that. Yeah. You're okay with me um, making it and giving it away to charity. That's yeah. okay too. You're okay with me making it and putting it up in an auction at the school, right? Yeah. If I did a quote. Um, what if I decided I wanted to make little pin pushes and sell them on Etsy or on my website with this fabric? Are you okay with that too? That's fine. As long as, it, as, long as you're not using someone's pattern who has specifically said, do not use right. my so, pattern to sell. Yeah. Fine. So first, yeah, and you're okay if I, whether I'm buying it, if I'm buying it wholesale and I'm making like, I'm just gone, gone to town, like making stuff, you're okay with that too. Now, what if I'm manufacturing, if I'm getting into more manufacturing, let's say Walmart wants my stuff. I suspect I'm coming to you and saying, I need a better deal on the fabric so I make make something. Like, I feel like super commercial uses are going to take care of themselves because the cost of fabric to me is going to be too great for me if I'm just getting it the way I'm normally getting it, either at my shop or wholesale, that that deal is just not going to be good enough for me. That, yeah. that you're going to, that's going to trigger me coming to you to say, I have this deal with Walmart. I need, you know, this much fabric. Can we do that? And can it be a better price? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Okay. So what we say in copyright is that the first sale doctrine applies that we're not changing the pattern per se, but you we're just buying it. And then we get to do whatever we want with it. Once we buy it, does that sound yep. right? Okay. Um, now what about, let's say I go, okay, food truck. This is a great idea. I want to make my line of food trucks. Do you feel like that's a problem or do you feel like it's the idea? Like how, and how, quickly would you be sort of freaking out that somebody else is making a line of food truck fabric or that's just in the nature of the business that somebody's going to somebody's going to start making llamas and then everybody's making llamas kind of thing I think it is the nature of the business um, because I guess when I brought up hedgehogs before you know a couple years ago you had hedgehogs from a couple different companies there were various designers that put out quilt patterns with hedgehogs Um, even when a new, new Disney movie comes out you know there may not be fabric companies that necessarily license the, the actual Disney, but if it's about, let's say, dragons, then, wow. you know, like, oh, there's dragon fabric. Totally. You, know, that, that, you know, you jump on a hot trend and you go with it. I think where you start to get to that, that line where you need to be careful about crossing is if it, it looks very similar. You know, you've got the same scale, the same type of layout. For, like, for example, the, the food truck Stripe. I, is that one of the ones you have? Uh, going in stripes um you know if someone else had food trucks lined up in stripes i think that that's that one yeah i have a lot of really cute ones yeah (laughs) this one yes that one yeah Yeah. Yeah. adorable the the concept is great but you've got to you've got to do it differently i think it's really hard to stop someone from doing food trucks but from doing food trucks that look like these that's right they've got kind of a vintage the colors the specific colors all that 
Yeah. So that's exactly, I mean, that's, that lines up with what I do here, right? Which is idea expression dichotomy. Like the idea of food trucks, great. This ex- expression, not so great. And then there's a spectrum of figuring out what, what part, at what point are you infringing on the work that already happens? Right. Now, I suspect that you're not registering these works with the copyright office. Is that right? Does, is there a standard, like, are you, are you, regi- I mean, sometimes people do, but I don't, you know, like, are you still honest, fine? That, is I, that beyond your, <laughs> nobody's ever I, asked you? <laughs> I, I, I can't speak to that. That's <laughs> great. Um, we heard from other fabric companies that they don't until there's a problem. That's kind of okay. their, that there's so much going on and they're so fast. I mean, that's the last sort of part of this is it feels a lot like the fashion industry in the sense that fabrics come and go, lines come and go pretty quickly. Yes, um, and I'm curious about that because it seems like, is it because tastes change or because you can only have so much fabric or like, you know what I mean? In a shop, like why are we seeing so much turnover on design? I, I think a lot of it is just always moving on to the next new thing. You know, if you ask any quilter, you know, how many UFOs do you have? How many kits have you bought or fabric for a right. quilt that you haven't actually started yet? Or you've made three right. blocks and then you set it aside. It, so you, you're trying to constantly get them to come back and buy more money and they're not going to spend more money to buy more That's fabric. Right. So they're not going to buy the same to. thing That's over right. and over again. They right. want something new. And, you yeah. know, it, it used to be that fabric companies would put out fabrics for a spring and fall market. And that was it. So twice a year. Yeah. And now you've got, especially, you know, as new kinds of printing come into play, right. you've got releases coming out in January, releases coming out in a March, just, in July. So much. I was, yeah. I was, I was um, interviewing um, the, uh, people at the Fat Quarter shop uh, yesterday and I was just like, I just feel like the more I get involved in this project, which is about now we're going on, we're in, in the year two, overwhelmed by it, right? Like the, 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 the amount of prettiness and options and all of that is, um, as again, it's exactly what you said. And I think that's part of the strategy. Uh, I mean, I don't think that you're not. It is. I think it it's is. part of the strategy to make us like, oh, I need this. I need this. I Absolutely. Need this. Right. But yeah. you know what, it's it's you a know. struggle for quilt shops then because, so yeah. with how I work in the industry, I recognize a lot of fabrics and I, you know, I can kind of yeah. date them roughly in my head and that type of thing. So I'll go into quilt shops, you yeah. know, down here where I used to live in Michigan and I will look at a fabric and I'll go, that was from when I was with the magazine. So that was seven years old. Yeah. And that that's hard. A shop is not making money if they have a fabric, a bolt of fabric that's seven years old, they need to be having the turnover yeah. in order so they can buy new fabric so that the customers will come. I mean, it, it definitely right. is a, it a vision. Vision. right. Yeah. It's all of that. And how long do you think that fabric should be in a shop? Like ideally, how quickly should you be having that turnover um, on your product? It, it kind of depends on what the fabric is. You know, shops yeah. have a lot of, of tonals and right. the solids and, and even batiks, which are not tonals, but they're not. They're just like your basic a, stuff. The yeah. people just need, it'll be there. Right, exactly. Right. So those, I yeah. think the turnover on those is, is a much different story. But yeah. then you look at, at very well-known designers and their fabric sells out quickly. And then they're scrounging Etsy, uh, Etsy for it, eBay for yeah. it, right. you know, looking for it. They're desperate to find it, that type of yeah. thing. So, you know, there's sort of a, a happy medium. I, I feel like most fabric companies that the fabric is around for about a year yeah um, the you know and there may be maybe some prints that are that are around longer but that you know by that point the shops and the consumers are going to have moved on to the next project so that seems to be about the sweet spot that people yeah. have, have run into because some some fabric companies will do reprints of lines if they're super popular they'll yeah. keep producing them and so that shops can keep buying them but yeah. It's, you know, you don't want a shop to be stuck with the line that they can't sell because then yeah. they're not going to buy more. Their customers aren't going to get new fabrics coming in. Like you, it's yeah. got to be a, a partnership to keep the fabrics moving through the shop, which makes everyone money and keeps everyone happy. All right. So, yeah, totally. That makes sense. Okay. So this is one of my ideas. I have a lot of ideas. I'm like, the first <laughs> thing, I have like 15 ideas that are way too big to do every day. Um, but it seems like now once the, the line is done, does the copyright go back to the designer? Is it revert back, or does the co- who holds that? Once you're not printing the fabric, 
does the companies hold it or do or it probably varies in between uh, yeah i would imagine it varies because yeah. there also are house lines that are done right. created in-house that don't go with the designer so it seems like we're getting to a point where like sometimes people love like tulip pink right people like go mad for her stuff um and the idea that you can only that that creates the scarcity and that creates the ridiculousness on, on etsy and all that yep. but it seems like we're now getting to a space where um, you could have a second run, uh, like internet thing where you could have print on demand with fabric that were these older lines that would give them a second, a second life in some way. Um, I'm wondering if that, if you see that potentially being a trend or like, it seems like these whole, they still hold a lot of value in them, right? So, you know, these the different fabrics, or do you feel like they don't hold value because people's tastes change so quickly that, it's just not really, nobody's going to want to go back to the fabric of three years ago or five years ago um, because we are always changing and moving in this, like fa- like like clothes. Like who's who really yeah. does want 10-year-old clothes, right? Like that's not an issue. So I'm curious about your thoughts on I, that. I, I think that it people, for the most part, are not going to want to go back. You know, they've got, there's pressure on the designers to keep coming up with the next best thing. Right. And so people don't want to come back. Now, there are some exceptions to that. And, you know, kind of like the, the Disney movies, they have the Disney vault, right? Right. Where the movies go away and yeah. you cannot buy them anywhere. Yeah. And then they'll, they'll come out of the vault. Yeah. And then you know, you've got like a six month period where you can go back and buy, you know, Beauty and the Beast or The Little Mermaid or one of those movies that has been in the vault for the last 10, 15 years. Right. And you definitely, you know, I've seen a little bit of that with, with some of the big name fabric designers where, you know, they will do a reprint of an old collection or they'll take the collection and recolor it and then put it out again and people go nuts over it again. But at the same time, there are some fabric collections where, um, especially if you've got a bunch of coordinates where the ideas behind those court now food trucks is not a great example of this, but where the ideas behind those coordinates will be reused. And if you've got a great dot or a great swirl or something like that, yeah. there's a reason that when the next line comes out, you can't include that again in a, in a new colorway that goes along with your new focal fabrics. Yeah. So you do have a bit of that, but I think for the most part, you know, the industry has trained people to always be looking for what's right. new and what's not. Like fashion. Like, I mean, it really does. There is a, this parallel. Okay, let's let's talk about this collection because um, we're going to run out of time. Abstract collage. So okay. I love this. Obviously, I love it. I just totally think it's super awesome. Um, tell me a little bit about Amper Stan's design studio. They, that's who did uh, this. Is that right? Yes. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of a lot of doodling and some yeah. layering, like the print that you're holding right now. You know, it has that sort of that scrap back, scrapbook collage feel to it. Yeah, it's got great. a couple different textures and the things that are layered, but it's in, you know super graphic. Yeah, and just it's it's meant to appeal to more of a, a modern audience. Right. Some of the the tonal fabrics, right? Like this, uh, the squiggle that you're holding squiggle, up, right? And it seems cut up and used in a background. Right. And with the modern quilters, it seems like these become almost like solids. Yes, absolutely. So standard that maybe the interesting pattern isn't the case, but that like there's one that's black and white like this. This seems to me, this black and white one that's small is almost the same as a solid because a modern quilter is going to use it like a solid. Yeah. Um, Well, that that one's a great example of a a stripe too. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, a, total a straight line but it's got a stripe feel to it yeah. so that that's the kind of design that you put out for for bindings yeah for sashing strips because you get that stripe feel to it if you yeah. look at the cross hatches that are in that design yeah you know, those are the ones that absolutely are being used as solids you know it's got that yeah it's got texture and it's got uh depth to it because of the yeah. colors to it but those yeah that's yeah. those are put out for the modern quilters it made me think about the modern quilters. I imagine somebody's already done this, but I see, I told you I have a thousand ideas and they all go away. But it seems like it'd be really interesting to see a retrospective of what their fabrics look like over the last decade that they have been a thing um, and how much it has changed uh, and what the look is. Because we think about modern quilting in a certain way, mm-hmm. but I think that probably is just today. You know what I mean? Like that it's shifted over time um, in ways that we would be surprised at in terms of 
also availability of fabric. I suspect that um, that wasn't the case at the beginning. Well, but, I think that's um, why they started you know, with solids. Because, because they were tired of the little flowers. Yeah, it was <laughs> solids or florals. And so, <laughs> right. well, so I was part of a, a, a modern guild startup uh, about eight years ago in Michigan. Yeah. That was something that we struggled with. And I know the, the modern quilt guild as a whole has struggled with too, is how do you define what right. modern quilting is or what modern fabrics are? Right. You know, in guild, we had done... Um, uh, like block lottery where everyone makes the same block you get a ticket and somebody goes home right. with all the blocks yeah. and we had several discussions about do we do we need to define what's modern fabric and if so how do we do that do right. we say you know fabrics by these designers are considered modern uh, right. which is limiting for sure right. you yeah. know do we, do we have to spell out okay no large florals you know no checkerboard but then you look and check right, and it's suddenly there's a yeah. weird large floral it's fine right it is um, a kind of it's mercurial in some way but you also kind of know it when you see it but how do you define that for people who might not see it the same way well and then you look at victoria finlay wolf and she right. is the queen of taking frankly ugly fabric yeah and making it into something fantastic because she yeah. can see beyond those large and i say large floors because she's done right. it with large floors a lot but yeah. she take something and and can transform it into a, a super contemporary or modern looking quilt just but with her style exactly. and so I think it becomes really hard to put that modern label on things yeah. but you also you struggle with and having been a part of two modern guilds now where people will say well that's not modern and so they won't you know won't even try it because it's it's not and you know yeah. that I think with the line like abstract collage is where Paintbrush Studio is trying to sort of get in there to yeah. say, hey, we can do modern too. And, right. you know, this you've just got to be open to looking and see what's out there. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I think they're great. And it does start to make, when you think about the name Paintbrush Studio, it does, um, it's this palette of fabric to then um, start to really design what you want to design, which is. Mm-hmm. Super fun. But, I mean, Painter's Palette Solids, you know, right. I, I, that's a great name for it. Yeah. Because it, you do have an entire palette of solids to be working with. So, and, yeah. And, it definitely and how it seems like naming and hashtags are super important. The part of the brand and part of getting it out to consumers yeah. like me is putting the right spin, I guess, putting yeah. the right labels on it. Um, and sort of what role does that play? Hashtags, in social media, um, in sort of what you do and how do you how do you make that consistent because um, I think that's interesting like how do you how do you do that part of your job well and it, just speaking from experience something that that can be tricky too if you just put the hashtag food truck on something right yes the food truck fabric will will pop up but <laughs> you also get a lot of other things and in some respects that can be really good because you right. can reach a new audience right um, I, I go to a, a brewery down here in Orlando that has food trucks that come a couple times a week. And I have definitely thought about like, what can I make for one of these food trucks? Uh-huh. Of this food truck fabric, because, right. you know, it's so fun. And that is such a, be like, they'd be so psyched, right? I know. I'm like, can yeah. I make curtains for them or like, but there's right. so many different food trucks that come. Um, right. But, you know, so it's, it's definitely making sure that you have a specific hashtag for the fabric in addition yeah. to something more general like that. And, um, you know, so that just making sure that you've got that consistency. I mean, you see when you get email newsletters from fabric companies or designers, it says, you know, make sure to use these hashtags or right, right. tag us and that type of thing. And it's right. all about having that consistency so that the word that is being spread is the same word everywhere. Do you see anything in the industry? Cause we've been talking about, um, in our class, we've been talking about hashtags and this concept of either descriptive fair use, meaning food trucks, right? Food trucks is just general, or food trucks as a, a source identifier for a particular thing, like food trucks, right? And that there's a difference between that. Do you feel that um, you see in the industry any kind of protectiveness over? I mean, we've had it, we've seen a case or two of this, but I'm curious if you have of you know, one person using it as a nom- as a nom- as a descriptor, uh, no, sorry, as a name of a product, meaning food trucks by Jeannie Fawn versus 
food trucks? And that is there any conflicts happening here? Are, is trademark becoming part of our hashtag system of sending a, sending a letter to another company saying you cannot use that in that way? You can't say food, you can't call yours food truck because we call ours food truck. Um, do you see any of that happening of, of territoriality of hashtags? I personally have not. Interesting. No. Um, you know, I think uh, using food truck as the example again, I think, you know, that's why for something that general, you kind of can cover both ends of it and say, okay, we're going to have our hashtag that is food truck, tr- food truck fabric. So then that will be the, the much more narrower uh, search that right. will be just that. But again, by putting in just plain old hashtag food truck. Yeah. You get- now, would you feel like if some other company started using food truck fabric, that that would be something that would like how protective of you of are you of that hashtag versus just trying to get people if they're looking for food truck fabric to come is it general or is it specific um, I, I think it know? depends I think for food truck I, I don't think anyone can really have a problem about that because that's yeah. you know that's as generic as right. grocery bag to be honest right. yeah you know, something more like if you look at abstract collage right Right. Well, that, that's a little more of a specific name. Or or Jackie's favorite, right? So that yeah. you've invested in that. Um, and if somebody else, another company was using Jackie's favorite, but they're like, but it's Jackie, somebody else, right? That yeah. there might be some more protect because it would be messing with your brand um, in a way that uh, the descriptive, fit, that it would product identity, it, it would be con- confusing to the public. Yes. Yes, it would. and and you run into that even with fabric lines. Um, you know, there's only so many descriptors you can have out there, and so you'll uh, you'll find it where there's two different fabric companies that have both put out a line called Floral Cottage, for example. Right. Because you know, I mean, it looks <laughs> right. cottage, it's floral. So right. you know, and I, I think companies do try to not have that kind. You know, right. you search beforehand and say, okay, yeah. has anyone used this at least recently? That right. type of thing, because. Yeah, I think yeah. Michael Miller has a polka dot they're calling Dumb Dot. <laughs> I thought that was funny because it's just like a really basic polka dot. But yeah. it, you could just see yeah. them being like, well, we can't call it basic. Right? Yeah. So, you know. Uh, yeah, so I mean, how many different companies are going to have a line called polka dot? So you've got to exactly. come up with some different name. So when yeah. you have something that's a little more specific, I think that's where yeah. it, it's iffy. But I also think, you know, the people in this industry are are great and super friendly. And I you know, as much as they compete with each other, I don't think anyone's looking to to purposefully do that kind of thing to each other. So yeah. I, I think that helps. That's really good. Well, this is, I can't wait. We've, we've talked an hour. I just, it's been so great. I just, um, I feel like um, this is really fun and really interesting and I love it. Um, this is um, a project. So um, we, we have a podcast and it, it's, a strangely popular podcast, but, um, but, um, but if you have other things that come up or new lines, or you just want to come back and chat, I would love it. So um, we're really about community and conversations and not like one-time guests. So if stuff starts to come up, um, I would love for you to come back. It would be so great. It's been a lot of fun. I've been, it went super fast. I, I know, know, right? I know. The half hour is impossible. When yeah. I'm like, you know, there's no way there's nothing. You're just like, hello. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you've done. Um, yeah. But I do love it. Um, we're also, we will, I will make things from it or, or um, we call our, our group, uh, it's a just one of quilt podcast, but we call ourselves a quilting army. So yeah. um, oftentimes I, I, I pass on what we get so people can make things. So if we do that, yeah. we'll, yeah. we'll let you know. And yeah, and, uh, I'll, I'll let you know what our hashtags are. We'll, uh, that's great. I think that's really important. Actually. It's so funny because I am now, we just started, um, you know, the thing to sign up. I've added that as part of it because it's very, it's like, you do need, it's like this moment is like, what's your hashtag? Like that's super important. What hashtags do you want to include? And so we've just started to add that to our, our lineup, but yeah, that would be great. This stuff is so great. I can't wait. So you've been listening to just want a quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane university law school. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend guard. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today.